Hello, my friends, and welcome to another episode of Unlimited. Today, we are talking about helpful versus harmful mindset work. And I got to tell you, I am a little fired up about this one. (laughs) As I'm sure you can imagine, we are going to be exploring things that relate to my industry. And some of it are things that have bothered me, but I haven't necessarily been able to fully articulate. Some of it are things that I've talked about before that have come into play that I'm going to be pulling from. So it's kind of a a wide swath of things. But being that it's April, I set that we would be talking about perception and the lens that we perceive the world through this month. So that's a big part of what we're exploring and why we're talking about mindset, because I think that it's really important to look at the dynamics of mindset. There are so many pieces that play into ways that this word and other words that are very popular, such as empowerment and empowering and mindfulness and other words that I've explored in previous podcasts, how they have been perhaps misused or I don't know if misused is really the word that I want. It's it's more that they've been used in a way that is not actually supportive and that that plays into some of the problematic dynamics that we currently have in our society. So they've they've been used to kind of cover over issues that aren't individual issues. And so that's kind of the core difference really if we we come right down to it between helpful versus harmful mindset work. And that is when things that are not individual problems are individualized. And it's something that our society does a lot of so that there isn't any societal responsibility, that there isn't any financial responsibility or any of that. And so now you can just stop listening because I've given you the answer. (laughs) No kidding. Uh, So what we're going to be covering in this episode in summary is the difference between what is and isn't mindset work over individualism and the pathologizing of stress, the false binary of empowered or victimized, releasing the blame game, and the power of perception and accessing choice. So essentially, we're looking at How do you remove helpful things from the harmful things so that you can utilize the helpful things without going down the rabbit hole of harmful programming that gets perpetuated in all the places, including the ones that are supposed to be helpful, like coaching and psychology and all of that fun stuff. So I've definitely explored pieces of this, so you will hear some similar themes to other episodes, but we're going to be looking at it in a much more directed way. I would love to hear your thoughts on this. What comes up for you? Are these things that you've been sensing and maybe haven't been able to articulate? Are they things that you've been talking about or looking at? Is this hit home for you? in any way, what stands out? Because it's it's certainly something, as I mentioned, that really rankles me and has in many ways within my industry, but that I've also been part of. And so I'm going to essentially call myself out within this episode around some of the things that I've bought into and that have kind of bubbled up to the surface as actually, this is not helpful and this is problematic and it's perpetuating norms and thought processes that uh, are harmful, as I said. I would love to hear your thoughts on this and what comes up for you as you listen to this episode. So please feel free to reach out to me. I encourage you to reach out to me and send me an email, DM me on social media, which I am still active on. (laughs) despite some of my concerns. And let me know your thoughts. And so now, without further ado, let's get started. 
Hey there, I'm Valerie Friedlander, Certified Life Business Alignment Coach, and this is Unlimited. This podcast bridges the individual and the societal, scientific and spiritual, positive and negative, nerdy and no, there's just a lot of nerdy. (laughs) Come on board and let's unlock a life that's as badass as you are. There is a tendency in the, let's say, the mindfulness spaces, which includes coaching, that is to make everything about the way that you think. Make everything about mindset. And I've talked about this before where not everything is mindset. Mindset will help you engage the things that aren't mindset, being able to understand the way that you think. But it's not all about being more mindful. It's not just in your head or the way that you think that is creating problematic dynamics. And when we over-individualize systemic issues, we fail to address the problem. There's a saying that systemic issues require systemic solutions. And when we make those systemic issues about the individual, in which we have done quite frequently because it serves the overall status quo to make it about people because then change doesn't happen. You can't have change to dynamics in the society without people, not person, people doing something about it. And So when it's over-individualized and we think we're alone, we have a tendency to beat ourselves up and to be like everything is personal instead of recognizing that there is a bigger thing to engage, that it's not your fault. So we're going to come into that in a minute, but I wanted to first address like, okay, so what is mindset? Let's talk about what is mindset actually so that we can start to separate those differences because ultimately... The harmful mindset is when we create an individual focus on a systemic issue. So it is a misplaced focus. So mindset is a mental attitude or disposition that predetermines a person's response to and interpretations of situations. It's a way of thinking, an attitude or opinion, especially a habitual one. Now, I say this, and I give this definition one because, you know, I'm a word nerd, (laughs) but also to highlight that mindset is a real thing. And as I just said, it is something that when you can understand what's going on, then you have more power to engage and show up differently so that you can perhaps see something from a different angle or approach it in a way that is more helpful for you to do what you are setting out to do. However, when we make something that isn't a personal problem a personal problem, what we set up is a dynamic of self-depreciation of lack of self-trust. Like, why can't I do the thing that I keep saying I want to do? Why am I getting stuck? And kind of beating yourself up over the situation. So, so often I have clients come to me who are very self-aware people. They have done a lot of self-work to understand themselves to understand how things work, to understand mindset and personality and all of this. And so they have a great deal of awareness of what they quote unquote should be doing and they are not able to do it and they are beating themselves up because they cannot do what they think they should be able to do with the amount of self-knowledge that they have. And Part of the reason why they struggle is because of that beating themselves up. We are trained to point the blame at ourselves, and that keeps us stuck. And that is purposeful. Not your purposeful, but it is societally purposeful because, again, it means that change isn't happening. If you are stuck and unable to do the things, 
If you are held down and unable to move forward and make changes, then you're not going to shake things up. You're not going to disrupt the system that is working for some people, but it's certainly not working for everybody. So there is a purposefulness to keeping you stuck and making it all about you. Back to the mindset idea. One of the things that I have talked about when I talk about mindset, and I I do an assessment that helps you understand your mindset better, and I actually, I love this assessment. It's the Energy Leadership Index Assessment, and I've talked about it in previous episodes, and I really dig into it in the episode, You're More Than Your Personality Test. So if you want to explore that further, go listen to that episode. But what I talk about in that is that, you know, so much of who you think you are is actually just the way that you perceive yourself and the world around you. It's who you're being in the world rather than who you truly are. And this is important to know because when you believe certain things about yourself, they feel fixed and impossible to change. But when you recognize them as actually being subjective, then you have access to shift the ones that aren't working for you. And to a certain extent, That is true. Now, sometimes this gets taken into the idea that what you perceive determines what you receive. And it ignores the fact that sometimes we receive things that have absolutely nothing to do with us. There are things that are really harmful that should never happen, that are horrible things. And it is not your fault. It is not your thinking's fault. It's not your perception's fault. And to make it your fault is abusive. It is harmful and it is unacceptable. And so when we take this idea of like what you perceive influences how you engage and how you engage determines what you get back, yes, That can be the case where we perpetuate patterns in our life because of the ways we perceive things. And and this absolutely happens where, say, you're on guard for someone, say you're used to a particular person in your life always expressing disappointment in you. And so you try and make everything perfect and end up being late to wherever. And so even though everything is perfect, they're disappointed because you're late. Or if you always have tension with a particular person and maybe they're doing work. Actually, I'll give you an example of this one. My husband and I were struggling after having kids and I had fallen into a habit of guilt tripping him when he came home late from work. From working late. He needed to work late. But I was annoyed about that and I fell into this habit of making side comments and He was used to me doing that, and he would respond accordingly to the the ways that I would guilt trip him. And I started working on that because I didn't like the way I was showing up to that relationship. I didn't like the way that I was handling that. And so I started working on it, and when he came home late, I just said hi or, you know, something innocuous, something that wasn't laden with a guilt trip. And he responded to me as though I had guilt tripped him because I had trained him to do that. So that is some mindset stuff. And we did a lot of work around that and and moved out of that patterning. But that was my mindset. And I could have fallen back into, well, now I'm going to guilt trip him because, well, he responded that way. And I almost did, actually. It's very difficult when you change a pattern and other people respond to you like you're still doing the same thing. And it's kind of like, well, why am I even bothering? But that's something that is like an individual dynamic, though it's an interpersonal dynamic too. And that's the biggest piece that I think is important to remember when you're looking at this sort of stuff is that Everything is interpersonal. Everything is relational because we do not exist in a vacuum. We exist in a framework of relationships to ourselves, to our history, to the people in our lives, to our families, to our society, to our career, to our employers, to our clients. All all of these relationships that we have, they're all relational. So Everything to do with the way that we think about things comes from some place. And it's not something defective with you that you have the particular mindset that you have. And this is the big issue that we come into is like, oh, well, it's your thoughts that are the problem. And now we've labeled it 
a problem. So we are saying that it's your thoughts and you who have a problem. Instead of going, this is an understandable way to think and experience what is happening in your life because of all of these things and everything that has happened in your life up until this point. This is serving you in some way. Now, the question is, is it serving you in the way that you want it to? When we can uncover the dynamics that are going on for you, the only person you have full power over is you, then you can take the shame out of it. You can take the blaming out of it and go, no, this is, there's an acceptance that comes. And I like to engage the idea of acceptance. And sometimes we think acceptance is like, oh, it's okay. No, that's not to say that it's okay. It's to just acknowledge its existence. And that there is a reason it exists, not a future reason, but a present reason it makes sense that it happened and that you are experiencing things the way that you are. And now what do we do from there? So that's honestly, before we go any further or dig into anything else, that is the core piece of all of this is to be able to release the shame around whatever's going on for you. Because as long as we exist in the shame cycle and the blame cycle of what's wrong with us, we stay stuck. It is so hard to step out and do something different when so much energy is getting poured into focusing on being broken and needing to be fixed instead of going, I am where I am because of everything that's happened in my life up until now. And I have agency and power from here to do something different now. That said, to an extent, because there are also forces that we are existing in constantly that are influencing us. So it's not like, oh, it's all past. There are things that are in the present that create obstacles that we are constantly engaging. Sexism, racism, individualism, <laughs> all of these things and more. I'm not, I'm not going to list them all because it would take me the whole podcast. That when we are constantly experiencing them, that means that they're not in the past. So they are always influencing us. So one of the things that we're going to explore as we go along is the idea of these stressors that are in our life. We are all experiencing stress to varying degrees based in the level of privilege that we have in this society. And those stressors don't just go away because you decided to think better. <laughs> they, they don't just poof, okay, you know, everything in the past up until now, but now still has those things. So they are still influencing you. So we can't just mindset those away. Again, we don't exist in a vacuum. So the saying that, you know, to get something different, you have to do something different, it is a lot easier to do something different if you understand how your lens and all these things that have happened in the past are influencing your perception and your subconscious access to making a change. You can't break chains you can't see. But it's equally important to recognize that there are other things that are creating obstacles in your life that are influencing your perception or your mindset that are reaffirming habitual patterns of thought that make it harder to shift, even if you know all of the stuff related to the past stuff. There are current things that also need to be engaged and acknowledged, and they're not all your problem. So some of the dynamics that come up with this, that are related to this, is the idea of positivity. And now how do we engage this in a way that moves us forward. So one of the things that is harmful when it comes to mindset is the idea that you have to think positive. Now, I have a whole episode on toxic positivity, so I'm not going to dig too far into it in this episode. But I do encourage you, if you haven't listened to it, to go listen to it, to just give you a brief snapshot 
Toxic positivity is the excessive and ineffective overgeneralization of a happy, optimistic state across all situations. So basically what it leads to is ignoring and avoiding problems as I can just think them away. If I just think positive, they will go away. Related to that idea that you, everything in your life is a reflection of the way you think. And so if you just think positive, you will attract positive things. Again, not everything is related to you and your thinking. So that just leads to avoiding the problems and pretending they don't exist, which doesn't actually do anything with them or about them. The difference if we went to healthy positivity, is the idea of seeking solutions. And at first, going back to acknowledging that there is something going on, that there is a dynamic. We don't even have to label it as a problem. There is a dynamic that is not serving us, either as an individual or as a whole, as a society, and it needs a solution. And so when we step into healthy positivity, it allows us to Look for solutions instead of avoiding or ignoring problems. I used this example the last time of the idea of even just a reframe. I want to stop spinning thoughts. My my brain spins. I want to stop that. Okay, well, what would be the positive look for with that quieting and focused mind? So getting a quiet, focused mind, that's what I want. So then we can focus on, okay, how do we achieve that versus how do we get away from stopping spinning thoughts? I want to feel less drained, okay? What would be the positive flip to that? I want more energy. Well, then what gives you more energy? It gives us a focal point that moves us forward to a solution versus getting stuck in avoiding things that we don't want. That said, there's often a reason why we want to avoid dealing with something, and that can be that the unknown of change feels too scary and overwhelming than staying in what currently exists. So there's always a reason something is the way it is, that you are where you are and experiencing things the way you're experiencing them. So rather than beating ourselves up over that, it's looking at what's going on. What are the dynamics at play here? Another term that I recently came across when I was reading the book Stolen Focus by Johan Hari is the term cruel optimism. And there's actually a book by that name by Lauren Berlant, which I haven't read yet. But the idea of cruel optimism is when something you desire is actually an obstacle to your flourishing. And I think about this as things like wanting to be skinny when you are a heavier set person. And that desire to be skinny or, you know, to lose 30 pounds or whatever it is can pull your focus to, again, more shaming because we have an issue with fat shaming in this society, instead of flourishing in the person that you are and the body that you have and caring for that body. I can't tell you how many people I've worked with who have a relationship with their body that is either non-existent or isn't very friendly. And when you have that kind of relationship with your body, you are naturally going to have trouble flourishing and caring for yourself. I mean, nobody wants to spend time with someone they don't like. So avoiding dealing with you and being in your body, moving your body, feeding your body, caring for your body is naturally going to happen. In the book Stolen Focus, there's an interview with Ronald Purser, who's professor of management at San Francisco State University. And he talks about that, you know, it takes exceptional cases, this idea of cruel optimism takes exceptional cases, usually achieved in exceptional circumstances, and acts as if they can be commonplace. So it's telling people a simplistic story that sets them up to fail. We are all looking for quick fixes. It's hard not to when there's so much going on. We just need it solved now. And so when we're looking for these quick fixes, we have this tendency to go, oh, five steps to achieve this, or somebody has the formula for that. And we're trained to follow rules that the rules will allow us to achieve the thing that we want. And so that's very attractive. Unfortunately, a lot of those quick fixes, those five steps, 
those guidelines for how-tos are built from people's experience, oftentimes people with a certain amount of privilege and their experience, and suggests that what worked for them will therefore work for you. And there's evidence or testimonials, but those are often the exceptions. They're not the rule. If this was a true thing, if this 100% worked, it would work for everybody. And what they say is that, well, if it doesn't work for you, it's because you didn't do it right. And that kind of dismissiveness of people's circumstance and ignoring people's real experiences is obviously highly problematic. One of the things that this is done with is around stress management and the idea of managing stress. So what's happened in our society is that we have pathologized stress. Instead of recognizing that there are real true stressors in our society, such as lack of health insurance, holding down multiple jobs, caring for children, caring for elders, long working hours, so many things I I could go on. There's actually a list that Stanford put together, I think in 2015, that listed 10 types of stress, mostly looking at workplace stress, but lack of health insurance being one, lack of discretion and autonomy and decision-making, threats of layoffs, long working hours, unrealistic demands, low levels of organizational justice. All of those things are not things that individuals have power over, but we make it about people. Like if you thought well enough, if you were more centered, if you were more mindful, then you'd be able to make more money. If you can mindset your way into making money, that's the whole idea behind money mindset. Is there a real thing around money mindset? Yes, money mindset, the way we think, the patterns that we have certainly influence finances. But it is not the only thing for most people that influence, one, the reason the mindset exists in the first place, and two, the actual dynamics that people are experiencing in their real current lives that affect their relationship to money. Again, everything is relational. So when we pathologize stress and all of these things, we make it a thinking disease and say that, well, stress and other problems of a dysfunctional society are due to mindless and maladapted individuals and not political and economic frameworks, because those do not want to change. They're very happy the way they are, even though they are highly problematic. This, in turn, feeds the over $1 billion mindfulness industry, because it makes money off of this problem, and it makes money off of selling it to you on it being your problem. And you see all of these like events Like, I'm going to call out Tony Robbins here because he really rubs me the wrong way. (laughs) But these events where you're, like, inspired and motivated and it gives you all these tools and you're like, yeah, and then you go out into your life and you can't implement them because you're in your life. So you're on this high and then you go into this space and you're like, oh, I I was given all the things. I was given all the insights, all the awareness, all the how-tos, and I couldn't do it. Something must be wrong with me. Nothing is wrong with you. There are reasons why this is the way it is. And there are reasons why those events are designed the way they are to make you think, well, it's my fault that I couldn't maintain it and I must need something else. Oh, I will spend more money. <laughs> I mean, that's that's what it is. So I told you, I get a little fired up about this. This is my industry. Or, you know, that's that's the thought, right? That's what the coaching industry feeds off of is this idea that it's an individual problem. So here's where I approach this with because I I grapple with it. It's something that really bothers me because I do recognize as a sociologist and as somebody who is doing a lot of work in the social spaces to recognize that there are systems at play here. I'm part of them. I've internalized them and deprogramming those things that I have personally internalized. Because, I mean, even just on a very personal level, they harm me and they harm others. And so being able to pull that out and go, okay, what's really going on here is so important. So how do I keep doing this work that's about individuals and 
isn't just about individuals. And that's been a big question. That's been a, a big exploration. And, and here's the thing. As I said at the very beginning, understanding your mindset can help you deal with the obstacles. Because when we, when we create this binary between either I'm empowered or I'm victimized, then we think, well, we have to be empowered over everything versus I'm victimized. I think you can acknowledge both. I think you can say there are things that I am a victim to, but I do not have to be defined by those challenges. I can find the places where I have agency and I can do the work to deprogram how I've internalized these belief systems that perpetuate the mindset that's harmful, right? The mindset that makes it about me. And I can take that out and I can then find choices within the bandwidth that I have available to me. And I can ask for help where I need it because I'm not beating myself up and shaming myself for needing help because I recognize that this isn't just me. It isn't that something is wrong with me. I like how Johan Hari in Stolen Focus gives an alternative of authentic optimism from cruel optimism to authentic optimism. And he describes it as honestly acknowledging the barriers that stand in the way of your goal and establishing a plan to work together with other people to dismantle those barriers step by step. In one of the articles that Professor Purser wrote that I will have, I will have all of this linked in the show notes, he talks about the idea of supporting social justice activism along with contemplative inquiry and engaging critical thinking versus non-judgmental disengagement. He says, when we recognize that disaffection, anxiety, and stress are not just our own fault, but are connected to structural causes, mindfulness becomes fuel for igniting resistance. So it's about feeling empowered to do something about the systemic issues. It's being able and in a space to engage it in a way that is accessible for you, being able to see choices in what you do, not ignoring that there are dynamics at play, but being able to accept that they are there and engage them as best you can so that you are improving your own life and the way you are experiencing life, as well as showing up to the changes that need to be made in a systemic level. Because I've seen it time and again where people enter entrepreneurship, for example, and they don't address the programming that they have brought with them from being in a toxic corporate environment. And then they just perpetuate those problems. There's that saying, wherever you go, there you are. If you don't engage those internalized things, then we just perpetuate them. We have to be able to see them and engage them. So that's the core of what my work is about. It is that process of separating you from stories about who you are, both the ones that you've been told from society as well as ones that you may have taken in because of personality assessments, which can be really helpful and validating, but also not allowing them to have power over your life. So as Chani Nicholas says in her book, You Were Born for This?, our preconceived notion of ourselves or others' notions of us can dominate our worldview and make us miss the point of our lives. So being able to take out whether it's the Myers-Briggs or your astrology chart or whatever it is, being able to step outside of that and be you and allow your evolution to happen rather than putting yourself into a box. And then separating those stories about who you are, and then recognizing that you have options, that you have choices that maybe you haven't been able to see before. Meeting yourself where you're at with those options, as well as you know being able to see more options with each step forward. Acknowledging and validating that you are where you are for a reason and removing the judgment for where you are with forgiveness and acceptance those tools are so powerful, both for yourself and for others. And then owning your personal power without blame and shame. So being able to 
release that idea that it's your fault when something isn't working for you, that you're not trying hard enough, comparing yourself with other people who maybe don't have these problems or that you think don't have these problems, whatever these problems are, and acknowledging you have factors that are different from anyone else, a combination of factors, a combination of relational dynamics, biology, family history, societal privileges, personal experiences, all of which have built into you as you are now and what you're experiencing now and all of those things, that it doesn't define who you're capable of being or what you're capable of having as long as you can actually look at what is, whether it's internal or external, and engage it and show up to it in a way that aligns with who you want to be and the world that you want to create. We all need each other. Almost everything that we are experiencing in life really isn't an individual issue. We are social creatures. Everything is relationships. So what understanding mindset stuff can do and how it can be helpful is allowing you to see the dynamics more clearly so that you can show up to them, so that you can acknowledge how those things are serving you whether they're serving you in ways that you want or not, and then being able to look at that and engage what's going on that's creating those dynamics. Again, whether it's internal or external, rather than making it all about something's wrong with you. So two things that I really hope that you take away from this episode. One is that self-acceptance, releasing the blame and shame of wherever you're at. There's a reason, and it's not that something's wrong with you or that something is your fault. You're not doing anything wrong, even if it's not working for you. And two, that the core to empowerment isn't about pretending that there isn't any victimization, but recognizing where you have choices and being able to show up to those choices, whatever they are. And sometimes we have choices taken away because of economic and political dynamics. So it's not to pretend that that isn't there. That's disempowering. It's to be able to recognize where you do have power so that you can engage it, where you need help, where you need others, and working with other people toward creating what you want in the world. If you would like, support with this, any of this, that is what I'm here to do. That is my work. It's not to ignore or pretend that there aren't problems in the world that aren't about you. It's to help you show up to those things, deprogramming the internalized stories that are holding you back from doing the things and engaging these things so that you can create the world that you want to create. So if you would like support with that, I invite you to get on a free initial session and I would love to speak with you. I'd love to support you. And like I said, any of this that resonates, I would love to hear from you even just to let me know what stood out for you and what you want to do with that. And I will talk to you all next time. Thanks for listening. I so appreciate you being here. If you got something out of today's episode, please share it. Leave me a review, take a screenshot and post it on social with a shout out to me. Send it to a friend or, you know, all of the above. Want to hang out more? Join me on Instagram. Or better yet, get on my mailing list to make sure you don't miss out on anything. And remember, your possibilities are as unlimited as you are. Allow yourself to shine, my friend. The world needs your light. See you next time.